Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Edward Escobar. I'm the founder of the Alliance for Independent Workers and the hashtag Drivers Unite National International Movement. We're here for Labor Fest 2019. And uh, thank you. And we are here to address the issues of workers and the rights that need to be given to the, the workforce that are being violated uh, by corporations and beyond. So we're gonna get started here uh, with the topic, the future of work automated and Uberized. As you see behind us, it is backwards for those on the live stream, Uber, Lyft, stop abusing workers, cities, gigsup.org, hashtag Drivers Unite, the Alliance for Independent Workers work, uh, Movement. So we're gonna get started. Uh, first, we have Mr. Douglas O'Connor, and he is of the famous or infamous O'Connor versus Uber, a $100 million settlement that was rejected by Judge Edward Chen. Uh, this was going back to 2016, June of that year. And so he's here to address the information. Actually, we're gonna, we're, we're actually gonna start with you, right? Yeah. Okay, so let's scratch that and adjust to uh, Mr. Christian Perea, Hustle by Design, and uh, he's a blogger and also a driver. So he knows what's going on in the trenches and he speaks from real experience. Hustle by Design, Christian Perea, here you go. Hi, my name is Christian Perea and I am the owner, founder, creator of Hustle by Design. It is the first rideshare, ride hail driver blog, which is dedicated to not having any sort of taking money from Uber via referral money or um, any advertising revenue whatsoever. Um, when I started driving in 2014, uh, drivers were uh, doing all right, and I'm just gonna kind of characterize uh, the journey of being a dri Uber driver in San Francisco over the last eight years uh, to tell you just you know what drivers started making and what they're making today. So um, in 2012, the first year that Uber was operating in San Francisco, uh, if I was an Uber X driver, I could uh, pick up a passenger on the corner of Market and Pine, and I, by the time I drove them 1.13 miles to Taylor Street, I would have made $10. Now, if um, you know, as prices have gone down over the years and uh, prices, um, there's been a lot of price cuts. Uh, you know, in 2013, the distance it required to drive down Pine Street to make $10 increased to 2.36 miles, uh, which would be roughly uh, starting at Pine and Market and going all the way to Pine and Fillmore. Uh, and that takes about 15 minutes if you get the lights and the good traffic and get across uh, 101. All right. In 2014, the distance to drive down Pine Street and make $10 would be roughly uh, Pine and Divisadero, and in 2015, it became Pine and Presidio. Again, this is all starting uh, with a passenger in an Uber X on a Toyota Prius, Prius uh, at Pine and Market, and just going all the way down. Uh, today, in 2019, if I picked you up on Pine and Market in my Uber X and drove down Pine Street, I would have to go all the way down Pine, down Euclid, onto Clement, and I would get to roughly uh, Clement and 4th Avenue uh, to drop you off in front of somewhere near Burma Superstar. Uh, so when we talk about the future of work and automation. Wait, 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 is that $10 now, is that like a gross fare or is that what you would take home with a driver? Oh, uh, that's what I would take home, that's in my pocket. So all these, all these numbers are in my pocket money. Uh, okay, that would be like, a, okay, after yeah. revenue, okay. Yeah. Um, so that is, that's where we've landed today. Um, in 2019. In order for me to make $10, I, I would pick somebody up at Pine and Market and I'd have to get to... Uh, That's about true. I, I did UberX in 2012 and 2013. Yeah. So I know that the rates, you know, right. it's about right. So, um, you know, moving into sort of um, how pay has been like calculated for drivers now. Um, in, in, the, in the past, it was purely based off of a rate card and a sort of 80-20 split between ride hail companies or gig companies. It was as low as 15 at one point when they It was as low as 15 or five, yeah. So, um, you know, as uh, 
we've kind of progressed into 2019 in the current pay for drivers. Uh, we've seen that the per mile pay has gone down. The per minute's actually gone up a little bit in the last year as part of a rate rebalancing sort of uh, situation. But um, what's happened is a lot of the money that has started to take the place of you know previous uh, fares uh, has increasingly been comprised of like bonuses that drivers get in order to uh, do a certain number of rides or to drive in certain areas. Uh, I can get a bonus as a ride hail driver for say completing three rides between 5 and 7 p.m. and I'll get an extra six dollars. So as uh, this sort of rate card and per mile pay has come down and as independent contractors have asserted themselves through the O'Connor case, um, we've seen an increase of like this sort of bonus based pay and that is how these uh, platforms have started to more or less exert a lot of control over drivers because you know as an independent contractor you do have like these rights that the companies acknowledge and will let you do they obviously don't advertise them so I, after a lot of these cases um, we've sort of seen like uh, things not maybe pan out the way they should have so uh, just a little bit of like example of maybe sort of this malicious compliance for independent contractors that we've seen uh, recently would be uh, how say uh, Instacart, you know, will flash a job towards their courier for four minutes with only an accept button, but they can't decline the job. Now as an independent contractor, they allow you to decline that job and without deactivating or firing the courier. However, if you want to get more profitable jobs, or do other things, you have to play this game. Uh, and if you choose not to, then you're forced to listen to four minutes of a submarine ping, like over and over again. Um, another example would be the, um, in the uh, lift settlement um, for, for SLR, uh, for, for that case, uh, I don't know, yeah. Um, the, um, for, for Lyft settlement and in their case with Uber, um, a few years ago they had like an agreement to do, for example, a favorite driver option where uh, drivers could, you know, build a passenger base. That was the intended goal of it. But we've seen that uh, all that Lyft did in this case was they made a favorite driver option, and that driver would be available for a gift card at the end of every week. But nobody knows about it. It's not publicized. It's just a technical sort of compliance issue. Um, you know, additionally, we have seen um, just kind of as a bonus pay has gotten bigger part of overall pay, uh, drivers have to do a lot more of this sort of uh, jumping through hoops in order to get uh, their portion of the pay uh, that would, you know, either make them profitable or gets them over sort of the edge to pay their bills after expenses, taxes, uh, you know, Uber and Lyft's uh, commission from each ride, which has also uh, been creeping uh, in its, you know, size from uh, O'Connor, when you drove, it was as low as 5% uh, for a special, uh, uh, you know, it creeped up to 15 to 20, 25, and today we're at an average take rate of around 28% uh, per Ubers uh, and Lyfts S1s. So, um, you know, here we are, we've come to AB5 in 2019. Uh, these companies are, you know, they're trying to get a, um, a new, a sort of compromise in place that would allow drivers to remain as independent contractors but um, I, I don't think that they've demonstrated in, with their history that they can really um, you know, do that in good faith. So yeah, that's the end of my thing. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Christian Perea. He's a former senior contributor and writer for, for the uh, Harry Campbell Rideshare Guy blog as well. And now, Hustle by Design. So thank you, and we will get into further discussion right after our panel individual presentations, and then he could go ahead and add more, as well as answer any questions that folks will have. So now we're gonna have Douglas O'Connor, and he is of the famous O'Connor versus Uber, $100 million settlement that actually we had done successful work in getting rejected. The uh, judge actually said that that $100 million settlement should be at least $1 billion. So that's how grossly off Uber was at that time, and they've progressively gotten worse, of course. So I introduce here Douglas O'Connor with O'Connor versus Uber and beyond discussing the future of work, automated Uberize here at LaborFest 2019.
Uh, All right. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, so uh, basically, I come from like a background. Uh, my first experience uh, doing Uber was probably in 2012. So I would, you know, respond to a Craigslist ad uh, with a limo company that was partnered with uh, Uber. They had a group of vehicles and uh, unknowns to me at the time, it was actually, a, uh, it turned out to be uh, a cyber enabled cartel, you know, obviously, because people were all agreeing to use the same price by this algorithm. And unfortunately, I mean, how the lawsuit really progressed was there were a group of uh, drivers, Uber black drivers, that had questions about, you know, there was a dispute about like employment status because there were a number of drivers that didn't say this at the time, but they later on disclosed after the lawsuit that they were concerned about Uber setting the price without being the employer. They actually felt there was an antitrust issue and that's the real reason why we had actually progressed forward with this because we were like, hey, you know, if you're gonna rate us and do all this and, you know, they were driving, Uber was having Driver of the Week awards for Uber black drivers. And, you know, they were giving gift cards out and things like that before the lawsuit. And that was our big concern, you know, it was like, hey, well, you know, if you wanna be the boss, then you should be the employer and stuff instead, you know, you can't have it both ways. So I think that was always really like the root of the cause was like an unaddressed antitrust issue and unfortunately, you know, what had happened was there was actually some serious um, collusion by uh, Shannon Liss Ridden to insert herself as the, uh, the lead counsel in this lawsuit. Um, people don't know this publicly, but uh, uh, there was a, uh, a driver, the second plaintiff, Thomas Colopy, uh, had met Shannon Liss Ridden when he was 11 years old. And what had happened was Shannon uh, Liss Ridden and a uh, Thomas Colopy's brother, known as James Hannon Colopy, a practicing lawyer in San Francisco, they went to law school together. And apparently, like, they had some type of connection to the point where Thomas Colopy had actually met Shannon Liss Rudin at the graduation when he was approximately 11 years old. And he, like, admitted this to me. So what had happened was, uh, around 2012, there was actually a lawsuit in Boston called Levitman versus uh, Uber, where an Uber taxi driver in Boston had actually sued Uber over like a tipping practice. And Liz Fruden was actually a co-counsel on that case. She wasn't like the lead counsel, but she was a co-counsel and you can still look that up as a public record to this day. So she actually already knew, and at the time, Uber was actually very legally vulnerable because their original partner agreement called for any dispute to be settled in the Northern District of California courtroom. There wasn't an arbitration agreement. So what had happened was, you know, somehow between the time Looking back at it, Shannon Liss Rudin knew that Uber was 100% vulnerable and already had Thomas Colopy as a driver in Uber Black. And somehow he started reaching out to our driver movement through Facebook around like, you know, May of 2013. And somehow she mysteriously never like filed the lawsuit until after Uber had put in the arbitration agreement in July of 2013. So basically what we had here is basically, I mean, probably almost like a case of, in my opinion, probably, I mean, it really borders on malpractice, professional negligence and malpractice, because, you know, we basically, you know, Uber was very vulnerable. She knew about the case, but there was kind of really what I feel was like an undisclosed conflict of interest because she was already priorly, you know, Uber was being represented by Littler and Mendelssohn. And there's probably like a good chance there already had probably been some type of, you know, the settlement, like disputes and negotiations and things like that in that Levitman case in Boston. So I think for her to come out there and come in and pull the publicity stunt she did, it was very self-serving because if she had really been looking out for the drivers, putting um, our needs ahead of hers, she could have had the co-counsel out here file the lawsuit before Uber incorporated the arbitration agreements. And that's, I think that that's where this whole thing, no one really talks about her role for like basically collusion you know, with uh, whatever her agenda was, and it sure as hell wasn't for the drivers, you know, and I think it's really questionable, I mean, that she's actually doing like a state Senate run. I mean, it doesn't really matter because she, she's kind of basically like another person that's gonna be doing back backdoor deals and colluding with people. So I think that was like the big disappointment about like being involved in this was, you know, really kind of, you know, finding out, yeah, I mean, basically, Colopy really in reality was the person who organized the lawsuit, you know, and used me to be like the lead plaintiff because he would always like do dodge and duck all the media interviews because they didn't want people to connect his brother to Liz Reardon. 
so I think there was always like this agenda on her part. And now of course she's like capitalized on publicity by being this gig economy expert. And unfortunately, I don't think she was really equipped to address the antitrust issues and some of the other issues that were appearing on the platform. I mean, there were some pretty um, proven allegations by other drivers like of stolen surge price money. Like in 2013, 2014, where drivers had set up stings with their friends or uh, phone, you know, pretend to be the passenger and seen that Uber would bill the passenger $100 and report $80 to the driver. That evidence had been submitted to her and she, they, she actually said it wasn't strong enough claim to take the court. And she never addressed the antitrust issues like, well, you know, if we weren't declared employees as the Uber black drivers and limo companies, she didn't really get an injunction that says, well, fine, then don't set the price anymore. She didn't really get to that. She never, so she essentially just left Uber Black as a, as a cartel, a cyber enabled cartel. So nothing's really changed, um, you know, cause I mean the Uber Black drivers, you know, our limo comes that have their own licenses and they're all agreeing to a pricing algorithm that unilaterally raises and lowers prices. So there's no price competition. So, I mean, basically when in essence you have a cyber enabled cartel in Uber. And I think, you know, with 85, you know, I think no one's really like brought that up. I mean, is anyone ever gonna really resolve the platform paradox? You know, it's the question because now people are talking about employment with 385, which is a good thing. However, there's still been a lot of talk by like Gavin Newsom, who's colluding with these companies in my opinion, and still wanting to maintain the independent contractor status, you know, the cartel status of the, these operations. So, I mean, basically what's happened right now with the way it's set up, is all these little bonuses they give you are, it's basically like, you know, like rewards, like drug cartels would give like the low level guys on the street corner for selling a certain amount of drugs, they give them a little extra percentage. That's what the bonuses are. You know, without employment status, it's a cartel. So, you know, that's what people could, you know, if they've ever been a part of a cartel, well, they've had their opportunity now. And that's kind of like where we're at right now. I think we're, you know, no, no one's really brought this up, but no one's really brought up like, I mean, just this pure antitrust liability you would pick up as a driver and I'm kind of really grateful that I got on early enough and the statute of limitations had expired on my actions civilly and no one's ever like, you know, taken me up on the price fixing that took place, you know, uh, back in 2012. I mean, 2012, going back to Christian was talking to, I think, I mean, there were times where like rides from like Alamo Square to the marina were going for $35 on a Friday night, like a Friday night in February, 2013. I mean, that was like crazy. I mean, there was like, I mean, Friday and Saturday nights, I was looking at the old grosses. I mean, there was probably like about a five to six hundred dollar a night gross on on UberX doing a Prius before you know things got really diluted with markets. So uh, yeah, I was able to go to. I remember that very vividly. I was actually able to afford to go to Vegas a couple times that spring. <laughs> times were good, but I think we're like a far away from that now. Uh, definitely at a point where you know there's. People I've, there's vehicles I've seen as a taxi driver I recognize just having been like a former valet and good at recognizing vehicles. There are some guys that have duct tape repaired windows for the last six months that haven't been able to afford to repair like a, a rear quarter panel broken window. So now they've got duct tape in place and that's kind of like where we're at right now. It's really truly a race to the bottom. It's getting desperate. It's getting dangerous. And you know, I mean, it's kind of like when, you know, when, when the drivers can no longer afford to make enough money to go to the crazy horse on the weekends, they start taking out on their female passengers. And we're seeing that, you know, all across the country, it's a, it's a crisis. Uh, commentary on the future of automation impacting both uh, Uber, Lyft, app-based workers, as well as well, I mean, uh, taxi. Uh, I think, you know, just, I think with automation, I think the automation, like in the driverless car thing, I think it's, it's largely overhyped, you know, because I mean, the bottom line is at the end of the day, it's, um, you know, in bad weather conditions, um, San Francisco and some parts of the West coast are, might be good for driverless cars because of the consistent fair weather. But when you kind of start going to the East coast, when it rains and it snows and there's like, you know, a storm going on, extreme heat, like 110 degrees, I don't know if these, this equipment's going to hold up. So I think it's kind of. I think this like automation thing's been blown out of proportion. It's just really like a, probably like a Travis Kalanick um, exaggeration. That's been like blown out of proportion. There's like the herd following the herd and money just following money. I think it's, I think it's just a bunch of hype. Uh, how about the uh, Uberization of the workforce? Okay, well I think that's kind of like a dangerous path, you know, because it's like, you know, we have like this paradox, you know, like the, the price, at least in this sector, 
and, and service uh, of driving for hire, you know, there's basically Uberization would basically become a price fixing paradox, you know, because, uh, you know, I think these companies have like this, I want to have my cake and eat it too thing where like, okay, we're going to like, you know, be this platform, but we're going to set the price and lower and raise the prices. So I think, you know, there's got to be some type of, you know, resolution that, that however, because of the revolving door at places like the FTC and the government, like the, the, the cronyism corruption going on, there's probably never been a meaningful resolution. That's like a problem that's like greater than Uber, you know, which is like the broken regulatory system that we have. What would you like to see happen moving forward? Well, I think, you know, I think what I'd like to see moving forward, I, I think, you know, if, if these people don't want to employ the drivers, you know, I think that we just need to have some like the next man up. Let's, let's bring in some new competitors that want to offer like true price competition for drivers, sustainable prices, and like a, a safer, you know, environment for drivers and passengers. You know, I think definitely it's about time we just, you know, we these people have had a chance, you know, and I, I think it's it's disappointing, you know, for the uh, chauffeuring, driving for hire profession, and for the general public to see what's going on right now. So I think we need to have like some some new some new some fresh blood in the industry, some new actors that want to like, you know, do the right thing and be rewarded for it. And I think that's the problem with the current environment is you know, um, the people who are playing by the rules are getting uh, shortchanged. Talk about the public safety impact also on the environment and taxpayers. Well, basically, you know what you had now, I mean, you've probably, uh, you know, with public safety, I mean, it's been proven that with, you know, the incorporation of ride sharing through studies, you know, auto fatalities increase like a good 3% in an area after ride sharing takes, takes place in a couple of years. And, you know, in terms of safety, I mean, you've basically gone from like the taxi industry, which was for hire, like in San Francisco, most cities prior to there was a requirement for every vehicle to have like a video camera in the car, like a live stream video camera for accidents and criminal like insurance purposes. That's been taken away. I mean, just for an example, I have a friend who drives a uh, Uber X and he was rear ended with his passengers in the car, but because there was no video camera in the car, they can't make a claim against the James River um, uninsured driver policy, hit and run driver policy, because there's no proof that it was a hit and run, right? Like, because there was no video. So I think that's like a problem, you know, for passengers, I mean, and drivers too, because drivers can be the victims of false accusations of sexual assault and things like that. So I think there, there's like, you know, the drivers and riders are not winning by the lack of safety and even the lack of drug testing, you know, and criminal rap ballot, criminal background checks. I mean, you're basically having a problem where, you know, the, uh, the, the people who play by the rules are, you know, not being rewarded. You know, I think that's like definitely um, an issue that's, that's become where, you know, the, the growth and the profits on paper for these IPOs and investors have been put ahead of public safety. The environment? Well, the environment, I think it's, it's been really bad. Uh, you know, I, I've commonly seen, I mean, just for in terms of public sanitation, I, I can't recall how many times I've seen a discarded bottle of like urine just thrown on the side of a street or a highway or found in the parking lot of like a Whole Foods. TNC parking lot. Yeah, TNC airports. parking lot, the airports. I mean, there's just like piss bottles where people like will urinate in their water bottle and just throw it out into the streets. So there's like a public health issue. And just like in terms of like, you know, pure safety, I mean, there's just tons of like distracted driving with all the technology these companies had. I mean, no one's ever invested in like voice activated, like a voice activated like platform where you can decline or accept a job and negotiate a price. You know what I mean? Like that, that's never distracted come up. Distracted driving. Yeah, distracted driving, you know, and despite the billions of dollars being passed through, no one wants to step up to the plate and, and do that. So, and then just, just in terms of like, you know, sexual assaults and things like that. And I mean, that's just gotten out of control. You know, it's become basically a free for all now for drivers and, and drunk passengers uh, to be vulnerable um, to like sexual assaults or just outright assaults, robberies, carjackings. And I think, if, stop to interrupt you from your statement, but I think every driver I've ever met who's done this for more than two weeks has a story of being, you know, at least having like unwanted advances at, at a minimum. Well, exactly. I mean, even as a male, I mean, no one knows this, but even as like, I mean, just a, a male, um, you know, driver for hire. I mean, there, there's definitely is like a lot of male to male unwanted advances and lightweight sexual assaults that take place with, yeah. with passive male male passengers that want like a late night encounter. I've always got people running my head, but without permission. Yeah. Like driving. So fun. 
Yeah, that definitely happens. I mean, definitely. I mean, no one really talks about it. Like, I mean, just, there is like a lot of like male to male advances that take place in the floor hire industry, and they, they kind of happen. Uh, but yeah, I mean, definitely for the you know female drivers and female passengers, I think it's definitely without the video cameras become a very dangerous game, and it, it turns into a he said he said she said thing. And and with you know the the ability of uh, you know sexual assault victims to like go to open court and like sue who, the, the companies now it does kind of create like a Pandora's box for drivers, you know, where they're, they're endangered from questionable accusations, which has happened to I me. Mean, I know um, when I was a valet, I know a guy named Chris Rojas used to work at the uh, Clift Hotel, who was a room service attendant, and some woman had like falsely claimed that like they fraternized when he was on duty. And he was like the victim of a, a false, like, you know, rape accusation. So I think that, that, you know, without the proper equipment there, this becomes a problem. So I think that the big problem is like, in my opinion, why the companies don't have like the video cameras in, in the car is it, it would bust out all the profile sharing that goes on. You know, there's probably people that, there's probably somewhere out there, some guy who had 40,000 rides for Uber and it was probably like a group of people driving a car 24 hours a day that weren't authorized to be on the account. But that looks good on paper for growth and things like that. So they obviously don't want to get rid of those people. Could so you, that's- Could you explain that a little more? What, well, profile sharing is like when an unauthorized driver gets and uses the same account for somebody. So if there was a live feed video camera on the cloud and there were like five different people driving a car, the face recognition software would have to pick that up. And that means by corporate policy, these companies have to deactivate that account. Because you know five I mean? people were using the same account? Yeah, yeah, exactly. There were unauthorized drivers. And so video cameras would stop that. Um, so I think it's just like, yeah, it's, it's an unfortunate situation where profits before people have taken place and anything to meet the revenue goals. I mean, you really literally have, I mean, like the American psycho business model like taking place here, you know, it's what it is. The price that taxpayers have to pay for all of this. Well, basically, you know, when you have like, uh, you know, like without workers comp, you know, for instance, uh, workers comp and adequate insurance, you know, like with uh, say when a, an Uber driver in California gets hit by a, a, a drunk driver and a hit and run gets killed, right? Well. Basically, instead of workers' comp picking up the tab for the kids, what winds up happening is the uh, the local ERs will pick up those bills, and also the um, California Crime Victim Fund gets access. You know, that's an example of how tax, you know, we as taxpayers pay for this now. Like, we'll actually pay for all these like wrecks that take place where there's a hit and run or a drunk driver. You know, you can actually like the state actually pays for that. So it's uh, unfortunate that yeah, everyone's subsidizing this operation now. And also, did you want to comment on that? Yeah, I could comment on uh, just uh, taxpayer sort of uh, challenges, problems. Uh, you know, in addition to what you mentioned, I, I think that in addition to what you mentioned, I think that um, you know when we look at like how the standard mileage deduction plays out yeah. for um, you know drivers, especially with teen, uh, ride hail drivers, yeah. um, the you know a driver does fifty thousand miles a year. Which is actually pretty low now. It used to be high, but a typical driver can do up to 50, 80, 100,000 a year. After that comes in on the standard mile addition, uh, deduction, the uh, claimed income comes in very, very low uh, compared to like gross and, and net earnings. And it uh, kind of allows uh, access to um, sort of programs and, and benefits uh, due to the MAGI, uh, the gross adjusted income. Uh, that affects um, you know the public fund, and that's not including sort of uh, you know insurance, workman's comp, or um, the unemployment fund, which you know in our what are we in the eleventh, twelfth years of a growth cycle right now? So you know none of these folks who've been driving for the last eight years have been paying into this unemployment fund. Uh, that's going to create a lot of like pain when we hit the next recession. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. No, there's yeah, there's going to be a lot of. Yeah, there's definitely gonna be a lot of problems, uh, you know, with uh, you know drivers, you know, not have not, not having paid into the system, you know, for unemployment and uh, social services. I mean, even I think even the cities had problems. I know the city of San Francisco, at least, has like formally like sued Uber and Lyft just because there were so many you know hospital bills at SF General being ran up after collisions, you know, with uninsured drivers, no health insurance, you know, no workers' comp. That yeah, that, that we're definitely like paying for it. Now, what the numbers are, it's, it'd be hard to really determine that because 
unlike um, prior regulatory status with like the CQC, no one really knows how many Uber Uber drivers are actually out there, except for the companies themselves. I mean, it's not really public information. No, no, the drivers individually aren't registering with the CPUC. So, I mean, what we see on the street and what's really out there, I mean, it would be hard to gauge. Even if it, it's very saturated, I've, I've heard from inside sources that they're talking eighty thousand plus on the streets of San Francisco, and you could just see that congestion on each block. You well, see I think definitely, yeah, I think there's definitely a problem now, and I think we've had also had a problem too with, I mean, just with the internal competition from these platforms of just promoting things like, you know, like these lift bikes and you know scooters and things like that. Those compete with drivers for rides, and you know you have all these. You know, so basically I think what you've had is like a scenario where you've been oversupplied to the market and then reduced demand for like, you know, rides for hire, maybe by like 10 to 15% over the last five years. And there's just been a general decline in the San Francisco nightlife. I mean, no one can deny there's just like less people going out and having a good time because the city's so expensive now. You know, you, I think you have a different demographic living in the city. So I think, you know, San Francisco, the glory days of like driving ride sharing or doing taxi in San Francisco are way over. You know, it's, it's in the past. So you're in a unique position because you've done taxi, you've done Uber, and then you're back to taxi. So your thoughts on regulations on par with taxi for the ride hail industry? Well, you know, I, I'm kind of thinking, you know, I mean, I think there, it, regulation would sound like a great idea. You know, I don't really know if it would happen realistically. I mean, idealistically, it sounds, a great out of realistically would happen just because of the the really the um the, the the revolving door and the system of like political donations and things like that and lobbying going on like that i mean we can talk about regulation but i don't think it would really happen because you know these guys would just go cry to governor governor newsom well it doesn't fit our business model it's going to hurt our bottom line and and you basically because it's like because like the state of california is like Kind of in a way an indirect shareholder through like the taxes of like the public the public the companies going ipo they almost have like an incentive it's almost like it's almost like state sanctioned activity because the state wants to get a bigger cut of like you know the 10 percent income tax on all this like ipo money so the state has like an incentive to like promote the business models to, to make it happen as they say you know as slick willie would say make it happen <laughs> uh, that, that's kind of like the problem you know i, I think there, there should be regulations, but unfortunately- and what type, what type? I think, you know, I mean, I think there should be regulations. I think there should be like workers comp or like a comparable, you know, benefit, um, you know, especially for like drivers with families, you know, there should be a system in place for survivor benefits and things like that, you know, or like a comparable life insurance policy for, you know, millions of dollars that would pay out survivors up to age 18. And that's like the most disturbing thing is to see like these moonlighting families, like the single mother, the single mother that got killed in LA a couple of years ago and they uh, got hit by a drunk driver and she had like two kids she was supporting and you know they're basically left it to the mercy of these you know what will happen is these companies will approach them and say hey we'll give you this money you know a really low sum of money we'll give you like sixty thousand dollars and you better be like you know we're doing you a favor and that's what they kind of do and they, these children are probably left without that's the sixty thousand dollars not enough to raise to support two children you know in California so I think that's what I would like to see. Would that ever happen? I highly doubt it. Well, the entry level requirements for ride hail drivers has been obviously known as being quite minimal. Well, uh, yeah, that's true. I mean, obviously, I mean, if you look at the Cal state of California, like, you know, the CPUC regulates TNCs, ride shares, and every other person, whether they're driving a bus, a limo, a shuttle van, a, you know, a boat, you know, they're driving like, you know, trains, so they're operating like a train, like Caltrain or Amtrak, you know, boats, planes, everyone that has like has passengers uh, for a care under hire is drug tested, except for the ride sharing driver. You know, that, that's one thing, I mean, that I find kind of curious. I mean, every, every vehicle, if you want to operate a limo fleet in California, you've got to register your vehicle and get a letter of approval to put that thing out on the road from the CPUC. And they have a database of all the limos in California. They don't have that for the rideshare vehicles. So I think there's a huge discrepancy. I mean, it's 
Are taxi drivers are taxi drivers required to follow the Department of Transportation guidelines on taking breaks? Uh, you know, I mean, the, 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 the DOT transportation guidelines are mostly for like what they call like Class B vehicles, like buses and like semi trucks. Okay. Like the DOT, it really doesn't regulate like the Class C vehicles like um, like on the same level as they would like a um, like a bus driver or somebody that has like a shuttle. Yeah, there, there's not, there's different set of regulations for like the smaller vehicles like that we would drive those, you know, they, they kind of fall off, they fall off their DOT radar because the capacity of passengers is not in their threshold. Let's talk about fingerprinting, vehicle safety checks, and that list that would be on par. What's your thoughts about that? Well, you know, obviously, um, you know, like you look at, for instance, like, you know, at the airports, I mean, traditionally at the airports, one of the, the public costs that's you know taking place like at airports you know before there was like uber um, when you were at the airport and you had a brand new car you were required to get like a blue temporary plate at sfo while you're waiting for your livery plates to come out and that actually prevented a lot of like bridge toll evasions you know like if you go across a bridge not pay for fast track they could send you a citation based off of that temporary license plate from the airport and when uber and lyft came into um ride sharing in general came into play that that whole system was bypassed at the airport and then you know with automatic reimbursement taking place i mean there's obviously like you know been a record number of like toll evasions that took place in the past couple of years across our toll bridges in the bay area um that's like one way like with the regulators have like kind of you know, dropped the ball you know in terms of like you know creating and so now it's, it's ironic that they actually just raised bridge tolls for everybody you know you're paying an extra dollar now i think to cross the bridges so I think there's definitely been some social cost as a result, you know, um, and even like the uh, the ability to like have an exemption from commercial registration, you know, what that did, I mean, that when once they were allowed the ride shares to register as private vehicles and not commercial, that actually allowed, that put a lot of like small limo and shuttle companies stretching limos out of business. And so what that did, that, the DMV actually lost money on that. So what they did, they, what they, they raised their DMV fees, I think a little bit, you know, a couple years ago. DMV registrations are up across the board for everybody about $20, I think, for private plates now. So there has been like a cost that's been like, you know, absorbed by the general public. I mean, you know, I mean, no one has done a study on this yet, but how much have uh, personal auto insurance rates gone up since the inception of ride sharing? That would be an interesting study. You're in a unique position to observe what's going on both taxi and ride hailing, as I mentioned. Uh, your thoughts about drivers across all driving industries having to work more and more while making less and less, well, essentially workers' exhaustion. Well, it's been kind of dangerous, you know. I mean, I know in the taxi industry, we've had like two, just in the last year, um, there was a uh, two driver deaths in the taxi industry that no one's really talking about. Like uh, one driver, Eric Larson of National Cab, actually was uh, sitting, taking a break at the airport, eating his food, and he actually like choked to death in his cab and no one found him until it was time to move, you know? And uh, that was kind of sad. And there was like also a driver named Casey, a big Simone guy in the Bayview. He had actually had a stroke early in 2018, came back to work, and then he was working on Saturday night, December 29th, and he paid his gated yellow cab over on Gerald Street, the, the gate. He passed out and had a heart attack right about 12 o'clock midnight and died. And you know, he had, uh, He'd been a cab driver before Uber, so he was having a really hard time uh, struggling. And he was even more kind of sadder was just going to his funeral service and, you know, find out his, his sister had actually would, was driving for Lyft for the past three years. And that was like a constant source of family stress and friction. You know, so I think this area has been like pretty divisive, actually. And what has paid the gate? He, he, he paid his rental fee for the night. He paid the taxi, he went to the, the window gas the car up he had paid like the eighty dollars or whatever it was for night to rent the cab and then yeah they went and had a heart attack like a minute later he was just waiting to go home had a heart attack and died on the you know he basically died on the job and that a lot of this stuff has been kind of kept quiet by the mta the mta's wanted to keep this quiet but i think san francisco's probably in terms of taxi driver deaths like probably had an equivalent number to the number of suicides in new york but they haven't been like they've been more like industrial accidents you know like i mean there was jeff de la puente who was the off-duty yellow cab driver um, who got crushed by the BART Trans 24th Emission. He was an off-duty taxi driver who was you know, too exhausted, you know? That happened about like 2016. The guy, remember the story about the guy who fell in between the BART train and got crushed, his pelvis crushed? That was an off-duty taxi driver. There's been a few of them. 
there's definitely been there's been about three drivers that have died at SFO um, in the last three years. Yeah, and I've heard numbers of around eight drivers who have died from work work exhaustion related issues because work exhaustion, so that everybody knows, that's worse than driving drunk. I, so. I, you know, I, I, I don't know if I, how much you, if you've experienced this before, but when I've driven for long hours, I've gotten to the point before where I stop at a stop sign and wait for it to turn green. Yeah. Uh, you know, about 10, 12, 14 hours into a shift around two o'clock in the morning. Yeah, drowsy driving, you know, drowsy driving is extremely dangerous. And I think like one of the uh, sort of just like bigger things that have, have gone unnoticed in the gig economy in the AB5 and just kind of this like battle and conversation around what to do with gig workers is that, you know, because of the, um, the price drops and the requirement to do so much work as a, as a result of these price drops increasing demand, that it's just keeping these drivers, these workers so busy all the time uh, that they, they become very easily exhausted. Uh, they perform the duties uh, less safe uh, and they become much more accident prone to the tune of, um, you know, seeing in uh, like New York City what's happened with drivers who've killed themselves uh, because of the, their loss of uh, value in their medallions and uh, the stress from um, having the drive sort of like in this new dynamic, right? So imagine we live here in San Francisco and you went and you saved your whole life and you went and you bought a Victorian home for a million dollars and you know you think that you're kind of set more or less, you're gonna be able to use this home as uh, equity retirement vehicle as you paid off and that million dollar San Francisco home turns into a $250,000 San Francisco home and now you owe on that million dollar loan so you know what a lot of dri uh, taxi drivers have experienced is, is, is even worse than what ride hail drivers have experienced in, in you know uh, especially these folks who are career drivers who uh, purchased their medallions. Uh, yeah, it's it's extremely sad. But, but, yeah, I'll give you the microphone back. I think I accidentally took it from you. Oh, that's, that's all good. No, well, I think yeah, there's probably like to a smaller scale, you know, a percentage of you know rideshare um, drivers that have you know leveraged themselves on an auto car loan they can't afford. Right. And those those, those kind of stories probably don't really get like much publicity or go to uh, you know they kind of go under the radar. Well, one of right the now it's. One of the like really big difficult things too, uh, in, in that respect, I think, is that we're we're starting to see we, people who people have to get a car to do this job. Like a lot of folks have to find a car that qualifies, uh, and even that's that's even with like uh, fairly low standards for coming onto these gig platforms, and that's like the very first like decision a lot of folks make, and you know getting into a rental or getting into the wrong auto loan. It, 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 like, that is like the most important decision you're gonna make.